The essence of a market system, as we've seen before, is that people receive an income which reflects the value of the output they produce. The free market is best exemplified here in the United States where incomes vary greatly and there are unregulated labor markets. We're uh, out here today looking for work, waiting for work, uh, waiting for employers to and contractors uh, in the construction industry to come by and pick us up for labor. This is a street market in Denver where unemployed people and employers meet to negotiate a price for labor by the hour. So this uh they're all going up to this guy because he's um, he's uh, an employer, and um, so they, they they got a chance to get a job from him. Yes, correct. Um, he's an employer. Um, looks like he's probably in the landscaping business, and so he'll get maybe three or four guys this morning. Um, every day, there's about 75 of us that come to the corner here. What kind of uh, wages would you expect to get? Um, the wages here uh, go anywhere from minimum wage up to $15 an hour. And the, and, and the minimum wage? The minimum wage would be probably about five twenty-five, but uh, most people pay uh, eight and above. On an average day, how many of those uh, 75 of you are actually going to find work? I would say probably about at least 25% of us. In a free market, the price of that labor reflects productivity. So in a market system, if you're unskilled or unwell, you produce little. If you're unable to work, you produce almost nothing. So how much income do you receive? Almost nothing. But if you're able to work, you're clever, motivated, and intelligent, then clearly you'll be able to produce a very high amount of output. You're likely to earn a very high income to enable you to afford lovely cars like this. It's inevitable that in a market system, the distribution of income will be rather uneven. The first thing we need to do is to take an objective look at what we mean by the distribution of income so that we can see how income is distributed in a market system. Sometimes we mean the functional distribution of income, which means who earns the income that's produced. So typically in a market economy, 60 to 70 percent of income is earned by labor, people working for it, wages and salaries and so on. Some smaller part of it goes to capital. People have shares and earn income in the form of interest and dividend payments. Some of it goes to landowners in the form of rent. But there's another question that is perhaps even more interesting, and that is, what is the size distribution of income? We can get a more accurate picture of how income is distributed by the use of a Lorentz curve. Imagine a society where everyone has the same income. Up the vertical axis, we have the percentage of the income of the society from 0 to 100%. Along the horizontal axis, we have everyone in the population, again from 0 to 100%, but cumulated from the poorest. So the poorest 20% have, given that all have the same income, 20% of the income. The poorest 50% have 50% of the income and so on. So we can represent this distribution by drawing a line of equality. Much more typically, we have an uneven distribution. So the poorest 20% might have only, say, 5% of the income and the poorest 50% might have only 25% of the income. You can see that the further from the line of equality the Lorentz curve, the more uneven is the distribution of income. Indeed, we can measure the shaded area as a proportion of the triangle ABC to give us a measure of inequality that will be between zero, everyone has the same income, and 100%. You might think of having one person with all the income and the rest of the population of millions having nothing. Now this measure is called a Gini coefficient. So the Gini coefficient is given by the shaded area as a proportion of the triangle 
ABC. The Gini coefficient will be somewhere between 0 and 100. Now we'll be shortly using a formula that will enable us to measure this area to find the value. And this will be useful because it will enable us to compare income distributions in different societies and see how the distribution of income is changing within a society over time. You need to be very clear about what the information is actually conveying. There are two things in particular to look out for. The first one is, does the data refer to income distribution before taxes and social security payments or after? It tends to be the case that higher income groups pay a higher proportion of their income in the form of taxation and lower income groups tend to receive more in the form of social security payments and so on. So if we take the figures after the deduction of tax and adding in social security payments, the distribution of income looks less uneven. In Denmark, they pay one of the highest rates of tax in the world and some of it gets redistributed to benefit lower income groups. This young mother of three, recently divorced, is studying at the local college while raising her children. Here you are with kids that you're trying to bring up on your own. Where's the money come from? Um, most of the money uh, I'm getting a, a scholarship uh, from the state. That's a normal thing if you are going to school. Then you can get a loan that's about 2000 a month. You can get that extra every month. When they're born to the age of three, you get 3,125 kroner um, every three months. And then I get uh, supplied from the city hall. Uh, I get 5,000 extra. Uh, and then from the state as well, uh, because I'm alone with two children, I get um, the half of my rent paid. The health care, is that free? That is free. We have a dentist. That's also for free. In that way, it's a nice thing, and a really good thing. It's a good deed, if you, can, if you can say it that way. She receives free tuition, child care, health care, dental care, a stipend for student expenses, and welfare support. So the Danish distribution of income after tax and social security payments is much more even than the one before such redistributive effects are taken into account. The other thing we need to watch out for is this. Is the data equivalized? Equivalized data takes into account that larger households clearly need more income than smaller ones. Suppose you have two households. One, there's just two people living in it. The other, there's mum, dad and four children. The non equivalized data makes no allowance for the additional needs of the family. But when we equivalize the data, we recognize that in order to have the same standard of living, the larger family would need more income than the smaller family. We're back on my desert island to consider further our understanding of income distribution statistics. You may recall from an earlier film how a few of us lived together and traded our goods and services. As our economy developed, we used money as a means of exchange. Now what we're going to do is to look at our earnings from that exchange and distribution process. On our island, we have no taxes and each of us has the same sized household. One. So we don't have to worry about whether incomes are before or after allowances for tax and social security, or indeed about household size. There are just three of us present on our island at the moment, but we're not all equally productive, and that's reflected in our earnings. So of the three of us, one of us earns 60 euros a week, one of us 20 euros a week, and the other one 20 euros a week. So what's the Gini coefficient for our little economy? The data we have is for our three-person island economy. Now here we've arranged our income groups from the largest, but it'll make no difference to the answer. 
we get our Gini coefficient whether we accumulate from the smallest or from the largest. And because we've only three people, we can calculate quite easily, and the formula that we can use to calculate it is given as g equals 1 over n times sigma a n minus 2i plus 1, where i goes from 1 to n. And a is the proportion of total income received by the person or income group, and n is the number of people or income groups. Now, if that term i is unfamiliar to you, it simply means each one in turn. We'll see how that works in just a moment. So, substituting into the formula with our island data, we have three people, remember, and we're going to look at each person in turn. That's what i means. So, we'll set i equal to 1 then to 2, then to 3, and so on. And remember that 60 is the income of the first person, 20 the income of the second person, 20 the income of the third person. So we start off that g equals 1 third, because n equals 3, times... Now the first person has 60. So it's 60 times... Now n is 3, remember. 60 times 3 minus, now we've set i equal to 1, so 2i is 2. So we have 60 times 3 minus 2 plus 1. And now we're going to look at the second person that has 20. So it's plus 20 times, and it is again 3. This time 2 times i, where i is now 2, remember. 2 times 2 is 4, so we've got 20 times 3 minus 4 plus 1, plus 20, the income of the third person, times 3 minus i is equal to 3, so it's 2 threes are 6, 3 minus 6 plus 1. So that gives us that g equals 1 over 3 times... 120 plus 0 minus 40, which equals a third times 80, which equals 26.67. So 26.67 is our Gini coefficient, the measure of inequality on our island. You may like to use the formula for, say, a four-person economy where each has a 25 euro income. And remember that because the distribution of income is perfectly even, you should get an answer equal to zero. One of the great advantages of the Gini coefficient is that it enables us to make comparisons between countries, even of significantly different levels of income. It's the relative income differences that we're interested in. The coefficient varies between countries. For example, in Europe, it's typically around 28 to 30, with Scandinavian countries the most equal at around 22 to 24. In the USA, it's around 45. In the UK, about 34. So the UK, has a more even distribution than the USA, but a less even distribution than in most European societies. Income distribution changes over time also. For example, in much of Eastern Europe, the end of communism in the early 1990s led to the development of a market economy where people could earn large sums of money producing what people wanted, Others were in a position to buy state assets very cheaply and earn considerable profits. As a result of these changes, the Gini index is around 10 points higher than it was then. In the last of our films, we'll return to the subject of the distribution of income and see some other aspects of it, because it's very important to social scientists. But already you can see that a knowledge of statistics 
enables you to grasp concepts which would be impossible otherwise.